Hi everyone, I'm Knox Peden, a parishioner at St. Joseph's here in Canberra, and welcome to this short video that I've prepared on La Dato Si Week, uh, which runs from Saturday, 16th of May, uh, to Sunday, the 24th of May. Uh, before moving forward, I want to take this opportunity to thank Father Paul for giving me this platform uh, to talk to you about this week, uh, which celebrates the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's encyclical titled La Dato Si on Care for Our Common Home. Uh, the document is in many respects a cornerstone of Francis's papacy so far. Uh, the title, uh, La Dato Si, translates Praise Be Unto You, which is the title of a uh, canticle composed by St. Francis of Assisi, who is Francis's namesake. And so I just wanted to do my part uh, to share with you its message and talk to you about the ways in which we can live La Dato Si in our own lives. So I thought about preparing a blow-by-blow blow or chapter-by-chapter chapter account of the encyclical, but it occurred to me that would be quite tedious. Um, and also, I'm not really qualified to talk about some of the theological and scientific issues that come up uh, in the document. Uh, I also want you to actually read the document, those of you who haven't read it yet or who may not have read it in a long time. Uh, I've asked Father Paul to include a link to the Vatican website where you can download a PDF and, and read it at your leisure. Uh, if you have any questions or want to talk to me about it, I'm always game, so please email me or call me or stop me after church sometime. Uh, and we can talk about it. Um, but that said, I do still want to talk about a couple elements of the encyclical uh, that I think are important, and then uh, move on to talking about some concrete steps we can do uh, to enact its message. So in my view, Laudato Si is a very special document uh, because it serves a dual purpose in the church. So first and foremost, it aims to explain to Catholics uh, the significance of climate change, uh, its connectedness to problems of poverty and global inequality, and its urgency as an issue uh, central to the church's teachings on social justice, uh, dealing with the value and dignity of human life. Second, and uh, relatedly, it's an important document uh, for Catholic evangelization. Now, what do I mean by that? So in La Dottosi and elsewhere, uh, Francis makes an important distinction between evangelizing and proselytizing. Uh, so the latter, which he frowns on, can tend to be a kind of browbeating, telling people why they're wrong, which is never a good strategy, not least because it rarely works, uh, but also because in Francis's mind, it's self-defeating uh, because it can blind us uh, to truths consistent with the Catholic faith that are disclosed to us by other cultures or domains of humanity, including the uh, secular domain. So evangelization, uh, by contrast, is a means of leading by example, uh, embodying uh, the Christian life and Jesus's teachings in a way that emanates joy and love. Uh, so this, not coincidentally, is a key message of Francis's apostolic exhortation uh, that was published prior to Laudato Si, titled uh, Evangeli Gaudium, or Joy of the Gospel. Uh, but the main way in which uh, Laudato Si is a resource for Catholic evangelization is this. Scores of people of goodwill all over the world recognize climate change as a threat to humanity and a source of injustice toward the poorer regions of the planet. But oftentimes the way in which our collective response to climate change is articulated and justified leaves something to be desired. So a predominant approach that you find in the policy uh, area is utilitarian. Now this is originally a philosophical term, but it's gotten some sort of currency in the press and, and kind of common vernacular, I guess, depending on who you're talking to. But the idea is that in a utilitarian outlook, you're always judging an action by its usefulness, by its utility, achieving some sort of predetermined end. And if you pl apply a utilitarian framework to climate change, uh, then basically you're asking like, what, what are our actions accomplishing and how do they either augment or diminish well-being? Now, of course, the problem is defining well-being here, right? But the, uh, the idea is that the industrial age uh, begat a lot of good things, but now it's offering not just diminishing returns, but harms to the planet. And we really need to sort of rethink what we're doing and judge all of the actions that we undertake in terms of their consequences. So I mentioned it's a problem sort of defining well-being. And here, in a utilitarian outlook, well-being is simply kind of the aggregate of human preferences. So if you do that, then you, if you base your action just on this kind of aggregate of human preference, then at least in Francis's view, you are just kind of doubling down on the very kind of outlook that got us into this mess. Now, Francis talks a little bit about utilitarianism in the encyclical, but what he really focuses on is what he calls a technocratic mindset, which is the idea that you know, every kind of barrier to human desire or human preference is one that can be overcome with some sort of technological uh, solution. 
Um, and there's never, rarely a sort of rethinking or reevaluating of the desires or the preferences themselves. Uh, if we think flourishing is being uh, obstructed in some way, technology is going to solve the problem. But the problem with this approach to the world is insofar as technology is a sort of product of our own uh, sort of gain seeking or our desires, uh, then our own desires become the standard of evaluation, sort of irrespective of any kind of limits, limits that seem to be imposed by nature or limits that we should regard as sacred. Um, so in a Catholic view, the limits on human action are, of course, uh, sacred, and they're part of that sacred quality of creation itself. Now, this idea that nature uh, is sacred is also attractive to many people outside the Catholic faith. But the problem is, if you, have a, if you divinize nature, uh, you're still left without a kind of a clear way of thinking about the place of the human in it or our relationship to nature. Uh, spiritual beings who are also some, you know, embodied, bound by nature, bound by our environment in some way. So Francis has this nice contrast where he says the mystery of creation, which is of course central to the Christian faith, goes hand in hand with the demythologization of nature. So nature is part of creation, uh, and we sort of take the mythic elements out of it and think rather in terms of the mystery of creation. But the problem is that some elements in the climate justice movement uh, go to the opposite stream of the utilitarians, who are very human-centric, and wind up sort of elevating nature itself as a kind of good in itself. And this uh, leads to a kind of naive romanticism in Francis's phrase, um, in which rather than centering humanity, humanity becomes kind of denigrated or becomes a problem or something that should get out of the way just so nature can run its course. And the result of that can be a kind of nihilism, or various sort of ideas of population control in which uh, we think, again, there's a technological solution uh, that is somehow more plausible than an actual kind of uh, reflection on our own modes of consumption and ways of living. So the theology of all that is quite complex. Uh, you can follow the footnotes of the encyclical. But the point is that the Catholic perspective uh, on this issue um, I think it could be quite illuminating for, for many people of goodwill who are frustrated by some of the apparent contradictions in the climate movement. Um, and so this is a way to kind of build a bridge with other aspects of the culture and also introduce them uh, to the Catholic faith. Okay, so enough of that. But moving on, there's sort of two key concepts that, that kind of come out of this dual perspective, and they're what I want to talk about now before getting into the concrete measures. And these two concepts are integral ecology and ecological conversion. Okay, so there's a chapter titled Integral Ecology, and here we see how Francis's views stem uh, from earlier, teach, uh, earlier church teaching on the integral nature of the person. This is the idea that the person is constituted, the unity of each of each person is constituted in, its, in the relationships uh, with others, with the family, with society, and of course with God. Um, so Francis expands this view to an integral ecology, and he says, you know, we are our unity as persons is bound up in our relationship with our environment in the broad view, not the environment just considered as nature, as some sort of just physical reality outside of us, but as something that is really constituted by our relationship to each other. Uh, so one of the most resounding messages that you get out of Laudato Si is this notion that the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor are really one and the same cry. Um, that the ecological problems that we are seeing are really social problems and vice versa. That you can't really prize these apart. You have to think about them together. So more, there's this idea that the study of climate cannot just be a material science. Um, so just as we can't think of ourselves as distinct from the environment or the climate, we can't think of the climate or the environment as just distinct from us. So of course, physics, chemistry, biology, all of these things are really important. They're essential for understanding what's, you know, climate dynamics and everything. But if we accept the anthropogenic account of climate change, which is the idea that human activity is having an effect on the global climate, um, then this means bringing in uh, the lessons of integral humanism, which, uh, you know, in the way, way those have informed social thought, and expanding that to, to the ecological domain. So one other takeaway from this is to say that you know, our duties, when we think in terms of an integral ecology, uh, are not just these kind of abstract duties to people really far away, we don't know, or people in the future down the track that we don't know, which can be kind of, they, these people can be abstractions to us, but that our ecological responsibility is really bound up in every relationship in our own community. And the idea is to, to kind of expand that idea to humanity, uh, present and future. So this leads to the second notion, which is, you know, how do you, how do you really implement uh, a perspective of integral ecology in your life? And this is this idea of ecological conversion. 
So prayer for ongoing conversion is an essential feature of Christian life. You know, as we review our treatment of others and our own behavior, we ask for the grace uh, to be vessels of God's love in the world. Um, Francis enjoins us to pray for an ecological conversion as well. So to include in our examine um, a review of our own treatment of creation. And we can think of this as a kind of three-way or three-stage process where we pray for this interior ecological conversion, which gives us a kind of growing awareness and sensitivity uh, to these problems, to these issues. And then the idea is that that would affect our lifestyle choices. So we find each day, just like when we you know, pray for other things or pray for other sorts of graces in our lives, we see, we discern the effects in our, in our own life. So these lifestyle choices would reflect that. And then the idea is once that you sort of develop that habitus, your, uh, your action in the world would also reflect this view as well, via, via your consumer choices or your political choices or things like this. So two further points to be said about this idea of ecological conversion. So one of the liabilities of the utilitarian view is it's very hard to motivate action. If you judge every act by its consequences and you sort of think, well, why does it matter whether or not I like reuse a, my coffee mug or just get one that I can throw away? Or why does it matter if I like drive somewhere when I don't really need to? It's just a drop in the bucket. It's not going to change anything. And the fact of the matter is, is in that kind of ultra rationalistic take on things that you wouldn't really be justified in changing your behavior. It would be kind of hard to motivate it. Um, but if you take Laudato Si as your guide, then you realize that like so many other aspects of Catholic life, it's these little things, it's these little daily sanctifications by which uh, God's grace works on us and changes who we are, that these are what count. And, and if you kind of get caught up worrying about the aggregate of all these things, you're kind of missing the point. Um, and it's no accident here that Saint Therese of Lisieux is, a, is you know, features in La Dato Si because of this idea of the little way and the sanctification of these, these apparently small actions. So the second thing is that many will know that papacy's, uh, excuse me, Francis's papacy uh, is really interested in intercultural and interfaith dialogue and sort of bringing the Catholic Church back to the rest of the world, obviously dialogue among Catholics, development within the Catholic Church, but also opening the Church back uh, to the world. Um, and there's a noble tradition, of course, in contemporary Catholicism of interfaith dialogue. You think of Thomas Merton and his dialogues with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen master and author of The Miracle of Mindfulness. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a line there in The Miracle of Mindfulness uh, that would not be out of place at all in La Dato Si, where um, Thich Nhat Hanh tells us that, of course, uh, walking on water is a miracle, and we recognize that as a miracle. Uh, but that shouldn't lead us to forget that walking on the earth is a miracle, that feeling the earth under your feet is a miracle, the presence of the earth, that that creation, that there is creation at all, is a miracle. And that we should be, that this should inspire us, that we should be aware of this, that this should really be part of our faith. Um, and so that's why I say that a line like that wouldn't be out of place at all in La Data Si. There's sort of very many uh, similar images. But so why do I make this comparison or say that this image sort of resonates with the Laudato Si message? And the reason I say it is that it's a reminder that if climate change is a global problem, it's because the entire of humanity is in state, is at stake in it. And this, of course, means people that are outside the church or outside the Christian faith. So it's not incidental that Laudato Si concludes with two prayers. So there's one prayer, that's open for all who revere creation and are worried about its fate, and then another specifically for Christians. But I think this is a significant moment because what Francis sort of hopes will happen, this is just my view, uh, with this kind of ecological conversion, is that it involves an essential openness that is grounded in humility and care. Uh, and this is an openness, though, that doesn't risk watering down the Catholic faith, but really fortifying it. Because what happens is that you see in creation all of creation, which means not just nature, but other cultures, other peoples, uh, uh, God's work. Um, and you realize that uh, God is present and, and therefore all of humanity. And so that this is really part of growing as a Catholic to experience that kind of approach. Um, so what can we do to live Laudato Si? Now I've asked Father Paul to include links uh, in addition to the Vatican site where you can get the text. I've asked him to include links to the Global Catholic Climate Movement and also a specific link to Laudato Si Week, which uh, has links to further resources. Um, I think there might be some stuff on there about some webinars or some kinds of events. But what you can also find there is a specific prayer that Pope Francis wants everyone around the world, 
at noon on their in their local time at noon on Sunday, May 24th, he wants everyone to say this prayer, this prayer for creation that really embodies the message of Laudato Si. Now, I should tell you that I plan to be in front of St. Joseph's Church at uh, noon on uh, Sunday, May 24th. Uh, to say this prayer and then also to do a silent prayer walk through the eucalypts of uh, O'Connor. Uh, I invite you to join me. Now we can't have a group larger than 10, so please do email me at knoxpeden at gmail.com if you want to be part of that, and I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you there. But beyond prayer, and the prayer life is essential, there are so many little things we can do. Uh, so you can think of these little things as little mortifications if you like, whatever helps. Uh, you can go another day without meat, obviously, besides Friday. Uh, you can think about the usage of electricity in your home, just leaving lights on in other rooms. You can just sort of think about your consumption and be aware of it. Uh, you can give a thought, I kind of already alluded to this, you should give a thought to whether or not you really need to drive somewhere. Uh, when you go buy groceries, uh, think about the supply chains. Do you really need this pomegranate that, you know, came by boat or something? Like, uh, what, what does it mean to sort of live locally and live more simply? Um, we obviously are all... You know, we've all been inducted into the virtues of recycling, uh, but recycling is good, but it's still costly. Um, and we need to think more about the ability to reuse, to reuse the things we already have. Uh, you know, Francis has a lot in Laudato Si about the problems with what he calls throwaway culture, which he sees as a real sort of sickness of our time. Um, and that, that's an idea that has a lot of meanings, a lot of applications. But here he's thinking, look, if you have a sort of Ziploc bag, and this is my example, not his, but like uh, you, you, we tend to take something out of it after we use it and then you throw it away. Think about giving it a rinse and reusing it. And he even says, like he says, reusing something uh, in this way is an act of love which expresses our own dignity, which is a pretty, you know, uh, I don't know, intense way to describe reusing a Ziploc bag, but I think it's an important part of the message. So the coronavirus pandemic has shown us what radical changes we can enact in our lives when there is a will to do so. And so for many, uh, this has been a story of tragedy and horror and pain um, and economic anxiety. Uh, but for others, especially here in Australia, I think there's been a kind of uneasy awareness of the gift of this pause in consumption, uh, which has led us to sort of focus on the simpler things, this celebration of rest, as Francis uh, calls it in the closing pages of Laudato Si in reference to to what goes on on uh, Sunday. Uh, there is a celebration of rest on this day. Uh, and he wants us to sort of take this idea and reflect on it and think about what happens when we expand it to the rest of our lives. So to put integral ecology into action is not to search for quick fixes or sort of grand gestures and certainly not to engage in any kind of like browbeating or moralism. It's rather just a call to live our faith to the fullest in each moment in a spirit of humility and generosity. So please do send me any questions. I'm going to stop there. I hope you make use of the links, and I hope to see some of you on Sunday the 24th. Thanks for listening. Uh, happy reading, and God bless.